I'm putting this up here mostly because I have some shit I have to get off my chest. And I'm just drunk enough to not give a flying fuck about what my former bosses would have to say about me disclosing incident reports or anything remotely similar. Guess an introduction is in order. My name is Randy, and I've been an EMT for almost a decade. Well, I guess it would be more accurate to say I was an EMT. Me and my former employers had what you would call a conflict of interest, and I turned in my resignation about three days ago. Really, it was just a formality. They would have fired me if I hadn't. For the past 30-odd years, I've lived in a little town of McDermott, Ohio. Beautiful little slice of Appalachia, as long as you can overlook the fact that it's located in the heart of heroin epidemic sweeping the Midwest. Hell, this county was leading the state in heroin OD cases last time I checked, and from my time on the department, I can verify that statement. So you're probably wondering what's got me so eaten up that I had to down a half a bottle of whiskey to open up about it. Well, put up a seat and get comfortable because you're going to be here for a while. I joined the department in 07, fresh out of school. Went through courses to get certified as an RN, but then I realized working in an office wasn't quite my style. Turns out, stabilizing trauma victims in the back of a speeding vehicle was. Had to take a couple more classes, but they were cake compared to what I've already done. I was pretty sure I had found my calling. Pretty sure is the key word there. You never forget your first run. The feeling's comparable to when you lose your virginity, except it's typically not as pleasant as an experience. Mine? A car wreck. 18-wheeler hit a red 2005 Chevy Cobalt. Well, nicked it more like. Semi was absolutely fine, barely a scratch on it. The Chevy? Not so much. Girl behind the wheel swerved and hit the guardrail, flipped the car too. We got there about three minutes after the call went out. We, being me and my partner for that shift, Michael. Mike was, and still is, a great guy. A little morbid at times, but in our line of work, you just pick that up. He'd been on for four years before I joined, and had some pretty messed up stories of his own. As we were making our way to what was left of the cobalt, I saw something that turned my blood to ice. Laying off to the side of a road, about 50 feet out in front of where the cobalt came to rest, was the driver. Even from so far away, I could tell she wasn't going to make it. Her lower jaw was an absolute mangled wreck, and I could see the white glint of bone sticking out of her forearm. Compound fracture, for sure. Jesus, I'd say, absolutely shocked at what I was seeing. How the hell did she... That's why you wear a seatbelt, rookie. Last thing you want to do is go face first through a windshield doing 60. Mike's words hit harder when he got closer and saw the girl was still alive. I doubt any of you have any idea of what sort of horrific sounds come out of the mouth of a human being who has what basically amounts to little more than minced hamburger meat for a jaw. Pained. Wet gurgling mixed with involuntary exhalation, not so dissimilar from an asthmatic wheeze. That's what I heard come out of her mouth. Within seconds, we had her on a stretcher going with another ambulance. Sometimes I'd like to think she made a miraculous recovery, and I just hadn't got the memo. But I'm not that stupid. With injuries like that, she'd have to be fed through a straw for the rest of her short, agonizing life. That wasn't what got to me that night, though. What did get to me was when we checked out the cobalt proper. There was a massive streak of blood mixed with bits of brain matter and skull fragments, which started where the car had flipped on its side and ended at the left rear passenger's window. Almost immediately, I thought the worst and took a closer look. That's when I heard the crying. Turns out the girl driving was a babysitter, had two little girls in the back seat and only one open seat. Irresponsible jackass had stacked the kids on top of each other and had them sharing a seatbelt. A reckless driver and properly secured children and an open window. Recipe for disaster. We had to cut in through the roof of the car to get to the girls and when I looked through that hole, 
something in me died. The surviving girl had her sister's decapitated corpse laying on her lap. She was holding onto the body like her life depended on it. When she looked up at me through the hole with a level of sorrow, no girl her age should be able to comprehend, let alone experience, I broke. I pulled her out of that wreck and hugged her with tears in my eyes and told her it was all going to be okay, that we were going to get her home as soon as we got her checked out. While I carried her to the ambulance, Mike was confirming that the other child was dead. That's when the girl in my arms said something that still haunts me to this very day. Why are you leaving Veronica? Why are you leaving my sister? She's hurt. Please, can't you help her, mister? I still have nightmares to this day about that night, about that little girl and her sister, and I just don't know how much longer I can deal with it. That's enough for tonight. Whiskey's wearing off, and I don't feel like going back to that night any more than I have to. If I do, I'll probably wind up doing something I won't live long enough to regret. Might come back someday, tell some more about my time on the department, at least the ones that didn't hit me that hard. Veronica and Abigail, those were their names. I'm sorry I couldn't help her, Abby. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I am the author that recently got a decent amount of attention and would like to explain a little bit about it. I've gotten quite a few messages asking if it's real or not and I'd like to address that. This story is true, but it isn't something I've personally experienced. The narrator and accident are based on my father and a particularly gruesome accident he witnessed during his time working with an ambulance unit. All the names were changed, of course, and I changed a few things from the story my dad told me, which I think need to be noted. My dad was a paramedic, not an EMT. The driver of the car actually died on impact instead of in the ER. The driver was a cousin to the little girls, not just some babysitter. And my dad didn't become an alcoholic after the run, but he did become a bit more emotionally distant. I'm just an 18-year-old high school student from Ohio, and stories like the one my dad told me to try to scare me off becoming a medic have only strengthened my resolve to become one. Even if I can't help them all, I can sure as hell try.